it's my pleasure to um, introduce you to our speaker today. And this is part of a series of lectures that are sponsored by the philosophy program here at Divine Word. And this year they were most gracious to ask me to invite a theologian. And uh, so today we have our speaker who is a member of the American Academy of Religion. She's a member of the Catholic Theological Society of America, a member of the Board of Pax Christi USA and the Anti-Racism Team, and the Society of Christian Ethics. And she's co-editor of the Journal of the Society of Christian Ethics. Her work focuses on the critique of theological and social systems that fail to see the humanity in the neighbor across the street, town, or the globe. Now you can see the connection as to why I invited her here today. Our speaker is Dr. Mary Jo Iozio. She's the author of Radical Dependence and uh, also Self-Determination in the Moral Acts, as well as a contributor called to be Peacemakers, a publication of Pax Christi, calling for justice throughout the world, Catholic women theologians in the HIV AIDS uh, issues and other casualties of war, war and born disabilities, and the Journal of Religion. She authored an article called To Something New, a People's Peace Initiative in Pax Christi, USA, and Considering Religious Traditions in Bioethics. She serves on the Ethics Advisory Board of the Bon Secours Health Systems. She's a theologian and an ethicist on the Committee of the Catholic Health Association and the Interfaith Drug Policy Initiative. She lives in Hollywood, Florida with her husband, Giuseppe D'Amato, her mother, Mary Iosio, and their Beagle Maynard. And most importantly, she's a dear friend of mine and was also my first professor when I began my doctoral studies at Barry University. So, Dr. Iosio, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Uh, to this presentation. I'm excited to be here. I'm privileged and humbled uh, to be your guest. So thank you, and um, especially those of you who are here voluntarily. I'm especially appreciative. So, thank you. Uh, so why this subject, fully human, fully alive? As Peter had indicated, Dr. Zagrakis indicated, I'm a theological ethicist or a moral theologian. Those are synonyms in terms of my title. And ordinarily, the terms fully human, fully alive are thought to connect directly to a, a discipline called systematic theology. That's the theology that looks at what we have to say about who God is. But I think it's important as an ethicist to know what we say about who God is because whatever we might say about God, we're saying about ourselves if we are the image and likeness of God. So whatever we think we know about God, we're thinking that through human understandings. All right, so here's my outline for the day, uh, for the hour, excuse me. <laughs> Stop reading it. <laughs> so we'll be looking at theological anthropology, the Imago Dei that you would recognize from the book of Genesis, right? In the first creation story, God created human beings in God's own image and likeness. Then we're going to look at the Trinity, that's the peculiarly Christian understanding of who God is for us. And then we're going to look at why that makes a difference for us. So the Trinity, we're going to move into relationality. Uh, and from there, what, what does this mean in terms of my beginning to understand and our beginning to understand what difference does it make in terms of the kinds of actions we do, the kinds of speech that we use, the people that we are. So the glory of God is the human being fully alive. This is an ancient ancient claim, um, Irenaeus of the second century, okay, St. Irenaeus of the second century leads us to what it means to be human and that it is immediately connected to what it means to be created in the image and likeness of God. 
So this discipline is called theological anthropology, and what we're doing in theological anthropology is attempting to understand why it's important that it was God who created us, that we're just not the cosmic stuff from the Big Bang. There was purpose in the Big Bang, and it may very well have been so that we could be here even in Epworth, Iowa today. <laughs> Right? So it's not creationism, which is the belief that God has God's finger on every movement and every thought we have, but that God's big purpose was to share God's love. We learn from the Gospels and from particularly the letters of St. John, the evangelist, pseudonym or not, um, that God is love. All right, so where we're going in this presentation is this. Can you love yourself only? We must love ourselves, but can we only love ourselves and be happy? No. no. That's what it means to be the image and likeness of God, because God is love, and love goes out. Love goes out. Change that. Okay, so if we're to understand ourselves, we must look at what do we say about what it means to be human, to theologically informed exploration of what it means to be a human being created in the image and likeness of God. When we introduce the subject of humankind, we know that we're looking in the mirror if you will, as much as we are looking outside at our sisters and brothers in our midst. When humanity enters the discussion, we are recognizing that, and it's evident here in this room, that humankind, humanity in its totality, is diverse in its expressions. Some of us are tall, some of us are short. Some of us have graying hair. <laughs> some of us have blonde curls. Some of us have jet black hair. Some of us have blue eyes, etc., etc. There's not a one of us, and even twins, who are exactly alike. Not a one of us. So diversity is key. When we begin to think of in terms of humankind, inclusivity is a key. <laughs> Right? Look around this room and we can see that there is not a whole lot of you're not allowed here kind of thinking going on. <laughs> Divine Word in Epworth, Iowa is saying, welcome. It's saying welcome. So it's we are diverse. We are inclusive. If we're really going to talk about what it means to be human, we can't just focus on some antiquated idea that the norm what is normative is something like a North European man. That has been for centuries the standard against which everyone else was compared. So every woman in the room fails the comparison. And if you fail the comparison of being human, because only that narrow norm works, Everybody else is a little less than that. We have just denied the diversity of God's wondrous creation. Okay, good. Recognizing then diversity, inclusivity, finally, we must take into account the contexts out of which each of us comes and into which each of us goes. So that means... As someone born in North New Jersey, I have the original thinking about the world as centered around the falls. We have a very large waterfalls in my hometown. So that was my world. Right? As I got older, my world grew by miles outward. Right? And for those of us who have had the great opportunities to travel 
and many of you will cross oceans to get here, our wor world view grows with that exponential dif distance that we take. Right? So it's context dependent. Wh where did I fall in my human family? I'm the youngest in my family. Some of you are the oldest. Some of you in the middle. Others of you, like me, are the youngest. Or perhaps there, some of you are even an only child. Right? So where you fall in your family has an impact on the way you begin to look at the world. Right? So the context out of which we come influence for the rest of our lives, unless we have something like an intellectual conversion, influence the way we see the world. And in this way, we can think of, for example, persons who grew up in the United States during the time of the Jim Crow laws. That was where uh, persons of African descent, the descendants of former slaves, were forbidden from using the same facilities or having the same educational or health opportunities as the white community in the United States had. Right? Thinking that, that that necessarily is true about human beings, that people with brown skin are less than human as people with white skin causes and caused the laws of the United States to discriminate against brown folk wrongly, right, wrongly. But if you grew up in that time period and you were a brown person, you internalized the thinking that you're less than the white persons. And if you were a white person, you internalized the thinking that you're better than the others. Both thinkings are wrong. Not any one person is better than any other person if it's true, that's the big if, that we are all created in the image and likeness of God and my being the image and likeness of God is no better or worse than your image and likeness of God. We are equal in God's eyes. So those discriminatory, prejudicial, and oppressive laws insulted the God who is in each of us. Okay. Don't you love the Sistine Chapel? Right. Um, you can go on the website and see how beautiful Michelangelo's paintings are. This is the wonder, there are so many wonders of the internet. There's a lot to be dangerous. There's a lot to be, you know, complained about it. But we have access to almost every museum in the world at our fingertips. <laughs> it's remarkable. Uh, so this is the famous portrait of God creating Adam, whose name, by the way, means earth creature. Adama is the Hebrew word for earth creature, not man the way it's ordinarily translated. Right? Adama, and you may or may not know this, but this is Eve. She was not an afterthought in God's plan as Michelangelo understood it. She was there in the beginning. This is Eve. Isn't that cool? Um, <laughs> we like stuff like that. Okay, so uh, you'll also see that I have changed the, um, the words to be gender inclusive. All right, so God makes humans in God's own image, uh, because I will never be a man. Well, that's not entirely true, I suppose, with um, <laughs> sexual assignment surgery, I could change that fact, but it's not going to happen in my lifetime. <laughs> so, um, so this is this is the case. Okay, let's move on. Um, <laughs> we like Michelangelo. Uh, all right, so what does the, what do the words imago, dei mean? And uh, we have in the Genesis, remember, we are created in the image and likeness of God. So there are two words, and we might ask the Hebrew authors, why two words? Why image and why likeness? Aren't they both the same kind of thing? What's different about them? There are two different Hebrew words, Salam and Deut. And the, the salam is the concrete. 
this is the physical, like this is as much an image. So I'm as much an image of a human being as each of you are images of human beings. Likeness is, to the extent that our scripture scholars can make a difference, make it understand the difference here, it, it is a resemblance. So we resemble God's own physical existence, whatever they, that might mean, until we get to the incarnation, when we do know what that might mean. Uh, so what the scripture scholars have told us, the, the uh, scholars of the Old Testament and those who are well-versed in Hebrew, is that... The Hebrew language, the Bible as we have inherited it in its Hebrew scriptures, not the Greek versions, but only in the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew authors, or the authors using Hebrew language, uh, were very fond of poetry and, um, and balance. You know, so it, it doesn't have to be rhyming. We all know that there are rhyming poems and then there are non-rhyming poems, rhyming songs and non-rhyming songs. The Hebrew is poetic in that regard, and as far as future scholars can figure, these two words are used to demonstrate the balanced perfection of who God is. Because if God is anything, for those of us who believe, God must be perfect. Why would we use the term God if God was not perfect? Right? Now, that's we can, we can deconstruct that history, what it might mean to be perfect, but we'll just take it as true for the moment. All right, so what is it to be godlike? And this is where we build on philosophers and theologians of the past. Right? Again, they're trying to figure out, well, what is it about human beings that distinguishes us from our dogs and cats and birds uh, and horses and cows and the other animals and the fish of the sea? What makes us different from them? If we're created, or we claim to be created in the image and likeness of God, and we know for a fact we are different than many of the other creatures on the planet, what is different? What is that difference? Well, things like rationality is a big one, right? That always comes up first in terms of the philosophical explanations. What is unique about human beings? We reason. We reason about things then we have to ask questions about, well, some person's reasoning is better than other person's reasoning, just as some people's physical prowess in athletic games is better than others. I used to play basketball in high school, but I never really got tall enough to take it to the next level. Uh, <laughs> We aren't all equal in the things that make us distinct, uh, but we are equal in the things that make us human. Right, so there's equal dignity there. So rationality, reasonable, reasonableness, comes up high on everyone's list when they're trying to figure out what it means to be like God. It means to be rela uh, rational. Um, it means to be just. Particularly, we get this in the Hebrew scriptures. It's implied in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, it's explicit. It's out there. And it's implied in the New Testament because what was Jesus? What religion, into what religion was Jesus born? Jew, right? Jesus was a Jew of ancient Palestine. So he was talking to Jews of ancient Palestine, but right? it wasn't ancient to them. He was talking to his people who knew what was contained in the Old Testament. So it did not have to be repeated in the New Testament. It is understood as the foundations for where Jesus goes and where the evangelists go with the revelation. <coughs> okay, justice is key and explicit in the Old Testament. So yeah, the, the, the Old Testament doesn't talk all that much about God as rational, but God is absolutely just. Right? God's justice is unparalleled and probably doesn't come very uh, much better. Excuse my language there. Doesn't get much better <laughs> than what you can find in the Old Testament explaining what justice is. Giving to others what is due. How do we figure out what is due? Well, if somebody needs food and they have no means to buy it, we get food for them. 
whoever we are that have access to it. If they don't have clothes, I'm thinking about the Beatitudes here. If they don't have clothes, and we do, we do something to help them to stay warm and protected from the elements. God's justice is caring for everyone. And we can't just rely on the fact that coats will be raining from the sky. We are the ones that bring coats to our sisters and brothers in need. Uh, justice and love, of course, we get from Jesus. We, we get this beautiful insight about who God is from Jesus. God is Father, Abba. How would you translate Abba? How have you heard Abba translate? You know, this is the way we start the Our Father in English. The Hebrew is Abba, who art in heaven. I don't know the following <laughs> Hebrew words. Um, but what does Abba mean? What if, what if you understood Abba to mean? Anybody? Daddy. 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 Not just dad. Daddy or Papa. Dada, daddy or Papa. This is a child coming with all trust and love to, to the parents who the child implicitly knows will care for them, will protect them. This place, and mommy gets there as quickly as she can. Right? Uh, there's a, a commercial that was on over Christmas, excuse me for referring to the media at this point, but there was a commercial on at Christmas had to do with smokers, and it's... There's a mother and a child in the mall, a very busy mall. And the mother says, you wait here, I'll be right back. And goes away, and there are people walking this way, that way, this way, that way. The child suddenly realizes he's alone, and he starts to cry uncontrollably. He's so frightened. You can see it on his face. And the ad is, this was... One minute out of the child's life. How will your child respond to your death from cigarettes? That was a powerful, powerful image for those people who are trying to get rid of the addiction to the nicotine. Powerful image. Okay, so Jesus introduced us to God as love in ways that the Old Testament didn't quite uh, get as specific explicit. Clearly, we know that God is love in the Old Testament, because again, what? Jesus is a Jewish man. <laughs> he couldn't have come up with the God is love thing without knowing that God cared that much for the people called Israel, called by God's own name, Israel, Israel, the, the last two letters of that name, E-L, is shorthand for God. Shorthand for God. Right. So, the people God chose us as God's very own. God calls them by God's own name. Right. This is this is a parent. This is a creator who is bursting out of the seams in love for us, the created, and the rest of the world. Right. I'm focusing on humanity here, but these some of these things I'm saying are true of our entire ecosystem, our entire planet the solar system, right? the world. Um, if it's true that God created it all, I'm referring to all of it, but we're focusing on the human being fully alive. In the Christian tradition, we have a number of theologians who are beginning to challenge, this has been, it's not a brand new challenge, but it's introduced in a new way in the past 25 or 30 years or so, challenging this um, philosophical system known as dualism. Who, who can tell me what is dualism in simple terms? Yes. It's, uh, there's two realities. There's a spiritual and a material. Excellent. Excellent. It's a, a clean division, right? It's a very clean division. It's either black or white. It's either matter or spirit. Can't be both in a dualistic philosophy. It cannot be both. They coexist, but not on good terms. 
<laughs> right? Not on good terms. But in, in the Christian tradition, though, there, there is an integration. There is no dualism. There is one reality, and that is as embodied spirits in spirited bodies. We cannot have the one without the other. If we are created in God's image and likeness, the spirit is in the matter, and the matter is in the spirit. So my physical matter is, is this that you see before you. My spiritual matter is this that you see before, before you. They are not two different Mary Joes. They are just me. Embodied spirits in spirited body. Now, the challenge is coming in the mid-20th century from, in the first place, feminist <laughs> theologians who have been fighting this dualistic tendency that suggests the spirit is up here and the matter is a couple of levels below that on the ladder. Right? Spirit is always preferred to matter in dualism. Traditionally and wrongly, men have been associated with spirit and women have been associated with matter, <laughs> right? So if spirit is better, it must mean men are better. If matter is lower, it must mean that women are lower. If the superior rules and guides and directs the, the matter, the lower, right? Then men will be the leaders and women will be the followers. When women start to get formal education in theology, and subsequently in other theological disciplines, they say, wait a minute. <laughs> My intellect is as sharp as your intellect, sir, excuse me. <laughs> right? And then the men say, oh my God, I never thought of that before. <laughs> Thankfully, Thankfully, if it wasn't for the fact that there were men who were open enough to the challenge that they are not smarter, stronger, brighter, more spiritually endowed than women, if we did not have men who recognized the error of that dualism, I probably would not be standing here lecturing to you today. Right? So when those who have power historically combine their forces with those who have been disempowered, those who have been impressed, who have been lowered, are raised up. Okay. In, in the Christian tradition, embodied spirits and spirits and bodies, we owe that renewal to equality in large part to the first women academics of the 20th century. So all of my sisters in the room, we stand on their shoulders and we owe them, we owe them the best that we can give so that our daughters' opportunities are even better than our, ours have been. Right? And by daughters here, I'm meaning all of the young women and younger women in the world, not our biological daughters, although that may be true too. Good. So we get to Jesus, and we see the image of God in ways that the Jews of the Old Testament could not have imagined possible. Although we were created, right, they believed we are created in the image and likeness of God, there were great precepts against creating images of God, right? Idolatry is, is a, a major sin. <laughs> Thou shalt not have false gods before me. So the fear was that any kind of idols that we would make would lead us down the sinful path of idolatry, Today we have the idolatry of, you know, raising money above other things, raising sex among other things, right? Uh, among, you know, food, clothing, shelter, <laughs> health, those so sorts of imbalances. Uh, 
The challenge is that that it is uh, God who comes into the human scene in flesh like we are in flesh. In Christian terms, God does become a human being. And it's not idolatry. Although for some of the Jews, it was hard to take. And when they heard Jesus, they left the assembly or the hillside. But for those who said, and they were probably the underclass at the time, Jesus' words were words of liberation. Jesus was speaking to them that God does not want you to suffer. So let's think again about just who this Jesus was. He, he is born in Nazareth. No, he's born in Bethlehem. He's raised in Nazareth. He's raised in Nazareth, which is this town in northern Israel. Um, it's a hill country place. There wasn't any kind of real economy there. It was subsistence farming. You've got a lot of farms around here. I don't know how many um, <laughs> descendants of farmers there are in the room. But uh, subsistence farming is, many of you would understand, growing enough food to make sure that everybody in the house is fed. Right? You don't have to have an abundance, but you have to have something stored up. But we live, in ancient Palestine, we live from our field work to, to our nightfall, back to field work, back to house. That was the life that Jesus knew as a young person and a young man. He was born into conditions of poverty. Oh, for Jews, this is a scandal that God would, would jump into that. Why didn't God jump into the temple? Why wasn't God born to the king's wife? There, was no, there were no Jewish kings at the time. <laughs> um, but but uh, let's say one of the high priests families. Why, why wasn't Jesus incarnate into, into the high priest's family? No. Jesus became incarnate in a poor, humble woman from a poor, humble town. God chose conditions of poverty so as to identify forever from that moment with those who have the least. So Jesus can say, Whatever you have done to the least of my brothers and sisters, you have done for me. And whatever you have failed to do, you failed to do for me. That's an indictment for us. Uh, so we've got the full revelation of God in, in the flesh that is Jesus. So let me tell you a little aside here. My first systematic theology course was taught by a Jesuit, and he was the secretary to Karl Rahner. How many of you recognize that name? Okay. Karl Rahner, major 20th century theologian. Um, helped, us, helped us turn to philosophy, or reintroduced philosophy as the foundation for the way we can argue in theology. Not disagreement argument, but conversation, dialogue. Okay, so there's Father Dyke, teaching systematic theology, and he's going on with, with this incarnation stuff. And I'm sitting there, and I start to get so excited, I can hardly contain myself, because I, and I asked the question in class, and it caused everyone to chuckle, but then everybody got real serious, because it was the logical conclusion of Rahner's teaching. Any one of us can incarnate God. It could have been any woman. It happened to be this Miriam of Nazareth. It may be that God asked many women over those centuries, and maybe she was the first one to say yes, or the only one to have said yes. It may have still been many years, but she said yes. It, the possibility for her to say no had to be there. Out of free will, she could have said no. But isn't it amazing to think that she might have been the only one out of many tries that God would have made to so identify with 
this creation he so loved. Okay. We share in God's body, in Christ's body. We have this beautiful theology of the church as the body of Christ. We are God's hands and hearts and feet uh, and hopes in the world for ourselves and for others. We are part of the story that is the ongoing salvation history of humankind. We continue to be part of that story. So let's get to the Trinity. This is hard stuff. My first class in the Trinity gave me a headache, and I thought, I will never spend time on this subject again. And it has since become one of my favorite subjects, as I'm able to attach it to theological ethics, because that's really nice stuff. Uh, so this is obviously from the Creed. We believe in one God, uh, the, the Father Almighty. You know the rest of the story. Uh, <laughs> these are two different images, but telling us the same thing about who God is. People hanging out around the temple, uh, around the table. Right? These are the visitors to Abraham and Sarah from the Old Testament, uh, and has uh, been appropriated by the iconographers as the, story, the first revelation of the Trinity. And here we have um, the God, the Father, Creator, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Um, God, it's so close to Jesus here, right? You can imagine how Daddy felt. When Jesus was incarnate, Jesus took on the whole mortal condition that's humankind. And my suspicion is you have experienced at least the death of one person in your families, and the pain that that death causes. Because we still love those people. We still love them, but our heart pains for their absence because we can't touch them anymore, at least not until the kingdom comes. So remember when I was talking about inclusivity, diversity, uh, and, and a, a global view, uh, relationships. When we look at what the Trinity is, we see that it is, in philosophical terms, a relationship. It is a relation. Uh, we ordinarily say things like, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In the late 20th century, there was this wonderful theologian, her name um, Catherine uh, Maury Lacuna, who presented to us another way to think about the tradition of the Trinity that made better sense for theological purposes. Because we could say we believe in the Trinity, and, and it doesn't like much make a difference in terms of how, about how we go about our daily work. Right? The Trinity, oh yeah, yeah, we believe in the Trinity. But if you ask anybody, what does it mean? It's something more. So she began to look at what the tradition historically had said about the, the Trinity that we lost over the centuries. So she went back to the Eastern Christian traditions, and she went back to, uh, to the medieval period, where philosophy was rather fully integrated into theology. <laughs> And she found this notion of the relations that defines God for us as a trinity. So we know that there is one God, right? We are monotheists in that regard. But we also say God is three in one. Three persons in one God. Unity in diversity. So the challenge that non-Christians give to us is... How can you say you're not tritheistic or polytheistic when you talk about three gods? No, 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 not three gods, not three gods. <laughs> we talk about one God who manifests God's self in three ways. Well, that's modalism. That's another heresy. So Lacuna is saying, but there's got to be something in there that, that makes sense for us with this trinity that keeps the cohesion that is God's unity. So she came up with this beautiful God for us. God for us. That's, that's the starting point for a modern, contemporary, Trinitarian theology. God for us. God the creator is for us the creation. 
God the Redeemer is for us beings subject to failure and sin. God for us sustaining us with every breath we take. God for us. That's the Trinity. That's the Trinity as Lacuna provides for us. So then we have these two words, theologia, which is the study of God, the mystery of God, and oikonomia, in English we would call this the economy, uh, and that's the mystery of salvation. So going back to Rahner and Lacuna both, because Lacuna was a student of Rahner's work, we see that God is so cool. <laughs> God, God does God's work in the most efficient manner possible. That's economy. That's the economy. God does God's work in the most efficient way possible. So when God is looking down at humankind, <laughs> or looking at humankind, don't know that it's down, or straightforward there, uh, when God is looking at the creation, God, God is trying to figure out, what can I do to help them see that love is the answer, that justice is what needs to be achieved here and now. And ah, I will become one of them. Because they like leaders. They like to have leaders. So I will become one of them. And if I can be found uh, convincing and persuasive enough to the people, they will see that what I want for them is what is best, what is love, what is basic decency. All right, that's the mystery. So what does God do? God becomes incarnate, and we know that incarnation as Jesus of Nazareth. Christ in, uh, excuse me, God in God's self, this is God having a, a little intra- Trinity conversation. God outside the creation, noviscum for us. Every theology class should give you a couple Latin terms. <laughs> there they are. Okay. Uh, so God, is, God's Trinity is unity and diversity. Unity and diversity. So there's God the Creator. Right, so there's three parts of the diversity. God the Creator, God the Redeemer, God the, the Sanctifier. There's unity, one God, in the diversity of the economy of salvation. We do not know God in any other way. The Jews don't know God that way. We do. The Jews have not accepted that revelation. But we have. We know God because of the Incarnation. And Jesus taught us the rest. By the Incarnation, we have been invited to learn the rest. Okay. Anybody know this artist? Have you seen his stuff before? Hey, Key? Um, love what he's doing here. So these are um, images that I wanted to bring to you to think about what it means <coughs> that God is unity and diversity, that God is for us. Um, and it's the relationship. We know who Jesus is because of the Incarnation. We know who the Spirit is because of the Incarnation. We know who the Creator is because of the Incarnation, as Christians. And it's all about relationship in the Godhead. So it's about the relationships between Mary and Elizabeth. It's about the relationships that the... The father really should be called the prodigal father. That the father has for the wayward son and still the love for the older son. It is about the relationship of Jesus at the well with the Samaritan woman. God always reaching out, wanting us to hold on to those relationships as the stuff that makes us different than our dogs and cats and birds and horses, as much as they may love us, right, uh, because we feed them and we walk them and we groom them, we pat their heads, um, <laughs> but relationships among human beings are, are qualitatively different 
And that's what distinguishes us. Even though my dog is, you know, the best. <laughs> Nobody's dog is as good as my neighbor. Um, <laughs> but God is creator. God is incarnate redeemer. God is the spirit who continues to sustain us. God, the way we know God is because God is in relation. So, let's go back. If we are the image and likeness of God, we must figure out how to be in right relationship with one another. If we are to be the image and likeness of God, we must figure out how to be in right relationship with one another. So we should not be sending drones into Nigeria. We should not be sending drones across Afghanistan and Pakistan. That's wrong relationship. That's wrong relationship. So to go back to the to the difference between us and God, because there clearly is, we're obviously not God, but we are God's image and likeness in the world. God's relationality is independent, or more properly interdependent. Because here's the thing, once God decided to join humankind in flesh, God went from being perfect in God's world to joining a fallen world. God entered into this place. So God went from absolute independence, absolute autonomy, but what was it about love? You have to share it. Right? God went from absolute autonomy to dependence with the incarnation. We are dependent on one another. How many of you farm your own food? Mm. <laughs> How many of you refine your own gasoline? How many of you sew your own clothes or weave your own material? Somebody else is doing that for us, thankfully. Right? We are dependent on all of those systems just to get by from one day to the next. So in God's autonomy, there was perfection. God didn't have to do anything, but God wanted to do something. God want God, you know, God is love, right? And love bursts out. So God used to be perfect. But once God enters into humankind, that perfection enters into God's very being. That dependence enters into God's very being. And that's who we are. We are dependent on the relationships that we have to make it to tomorrow. To Mary and Joseph and to the law. Uh, The dependence that God assumes in the incarnation, again, this is, what, this is folly to the Jews, no, folly to the Greeks, uh, scandal to the Jews. Folly to the Greeks, scandal to the Jews, that God would become a human being. But that's exactly what God did. We believe that is exactly what God did. All right. Uh, so our relationships with one another take on a new meaning when God enters into those relationships too. And we get raised up because Jesus came down, if down is the right term to use. So what does this mean? How do we get there? What, how, how will we really be this fully human, fully alive? How will we be the image and likeness of a God who enters into the most humblest of human life, uh, human experiences. Well, Aquinas, you know, he's you know, a, a long dead buddy um, of mine, but <laughs> a buddy nonetheless. Um, I spent a lot of time with this dead person um, <laughs> and love it, glad that I have it. Um, so how are we to respond to a God who enters into this life? And Aquinas gives us some directions. He talks about moral virtues and theological virtues. Those are the ways to understand how we are to best be that image and likeness of God and how, therefore, to best be <coughs> those beings who are fully human and fully alive. So, here's 
another Greek, here's a Greek word for you, eudaimonian ethics. You know that the, the prefix eu in, um, in Greek means what? Anybody know what it means besides good. Dr. Zagrathis? Good. good or good. well, right? So euthanasia is a good death. <laughs> Eudaimona, eudaimonia is a good demon. Not in a negative sense, right? Demons are, are spirits for all intents and purposes in this book. So a good spirit ethics of virtue um, is based on the notion that happiness is the, the place where we are all destined to go. So for those of you who have taken your basic metaphysics and philosophy class, know that that's where we're heading. <laughs> happiness is the purpose of the human life. Right? In, the, in the words of the Declaration of Independence of the United States, all people are created equal, um, and we are all to enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? It's that pursuit of happiness that is Aristotelian and Thomist, right? So it's both Aristotle from the Greek, um, ancient Greek, classical Greek periods in the 4th century BC, and, um, and Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century of the Christian era. All right, so happiness, happiness has to do with um, exercising our powers of thinking, of speaking, of writing, of exercising, of... How many of you play a musical instrument? Okay, so what do you... What happens when you don't practice? <laughs> you get rusty at it, don't you? All right. Um, any dancers? <laughs> no dancers in the room. Oh, there we are, the dancer. Okay, okay. All right, so tell me this. Tell me, uh, in terms of dancing, right, do you try to dance or exercise every day? Yeah, you have to uh, stretch. You have to stretch. You have to do something every day. And if you don't, how long does it take you to get back to where you were before you stopped? A couple months and you start losing when you start trying to do the same thing. Right. All right. The ballet dancers say, for every one day that I have missed, it's going to take me at least two to get back to where I was before I missed that exercise day. Right? So it's, it's the practice of the virtues that leads to our happiness, right? Because our, our powers of seeing, of reasoning, of smelling, of tasting, um, so fine cuisine. Right? I'm trying to develop a more sophisticated palate. <laughs> but I can't get sophisticated palate if I don't eat more exotic type foods. In terms of exotic, I mean just not American fish. <laughs> more than hamburgers and hot dogs. Uh, <laughs> we have to train ourselves to be good at what we do. Those are the trainings of our powers, whether it's to plie. I know that wasn't a plie. But <laughs> um, or, or a riff on a piano or a guitar. Um, we have to practice to be the best we can at that. And in terms of studying, right, so this is where discipline comes in. We have to be disciplined to exercise every day or, or practice our stretches for dance every day. We have to practice our piano or, or violin every day or flute for those who are wind, um, wind instrument players. Um, we have to practice them so that we get better at them, not that we just stay the same. We need to practice to reach perfection. Once we get to perfection, bingo, happiness. The thing is, we really don't get there in this life, um, but we do our best to at least make our um, current existence not just bearable, but happy. Right? When we work on perfecting the people we are becoming, we will become those people. So we have a vision of who God is calling us to be. And, and many of you have answered a particular kind of calling. Um, each of us, I would imagine, have, um, have reached for a particular kind of calling. So this is, it resembles our Irenaeus as being human, being fully human and being fully alive. The virtues help us get there, but they can't get us to heaven. They can at least predispose us to heaven. Um, so what are the implications? Well, we've got the moral virtues, we've got the theological virtues, and then we also have the Catholic social teaching tradition. And for me, for this presentation, um, 
I want to focus on the respect for others, solidarity, the common good, and the preferential option for the poor. Solidarity is um, following Jesus. He became one with those who were least advantaged. And that challenges us to be what we can be with and for those who are less advantaged uh, than we are. Uh, we respect their dignity. We work together for the common good because when the least of us suffers, we all suffer. Here's a simple example. Anybody catch the flu this season? <laughs> Everybody suffered because somebody infected the school. <laughs> right? Common good would say, let's get everybody vaccinated or let's do, you know, super hygienic training so that we can at least reduce the incidence of an, a, an, an epidemic uh, at the Vine Word. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, those who have power and privilege are challenged by the Gospels to do what we can with and for those who are less advantaged. We will be judged on how well those of us who have privileges will have responded to the needs of our sisters and brothers in, um, in dire circumstances. So regardless of power and privilege, this is a challenge that Jesus has issued to us. We are called to love. We can do no less. Um, and this is to be fully, fully human <laughs> and fully alive. My time is up. Thank you so much.